Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the second presentation in our Tier 3 strand for FBA, VIPs, and Tier 3 systems. I'm Rose Ivanum. I'm a at the University of South Florida. And just a little bit about me, if you don't know me, and my background is in behavioral intervention, specifically for students with disabilities. Um, and then I also do a lot of research and work with students with autism. So we're gonna go ahead and get started because I tend to um, have too much information in the amount of time and I um, then have to race through the last few uh, bit of pieces of information. So I'm hoping that all of you have been at least one other session if you've gone through these and rather than dwell on all of these, um, we're gonna just make sure that if you have any questions, make sure you put them in the chat box. Uh, make sure you notice that where you put the questions for us so that at the, hopefully the last 15 minutes, we'll be able to go through any of your questions and use the chat uh, to also engage in different um, experiences. Okay, so there we go, questions in the polls tab. And then um, we're gonna keep on going through these because I'm sure you've seen these. This is the most important one, I'm assuming. And this is if you need technical support, there is a help desk. So go to the help desk and be patient. Um, I understand that today there may be a bit of technical problems going on that may be beyond the forum um, platforms and the bigger platforms are at fault. So just be patient. And you, usually we, we do our appropriate behaviors when we ask for help and wait patiently. And then working in your team, you've been seeing these five questions again. So we're gonna go right into this session. Uh, and hopefully when you are finished with this session, you're gonna be able to at least describe three core components or features of comprehensive functional behavior assessment, behavior intervention plan practices. And you can compare this process with Kathleen's um, basic FBA BIP. And then some key systemic features you might wanna to consider to lead you into Don Kincaid's presentation that follows this one. And so what we're gonna to do to this afternoon, this hour um, in 15 minutes is we're gonna start talking about what are the key features of comprehensive FBA BIP approaches, a little bit of comparing and contrasting with basic and talk about the primary steps. And then I'm gonna show you two examples of comprehensive approaches implemented with case studies. And I'm going to use a specific FBA BIP model that we have done extensive research on. The model that I'm going to show you, which is called Prevent, Teach, Reinforce, is not meant for you to do Prevent, Teach, Reinforce as your model. However, it just highlights how we've taken a FBA approach, made it very comprehensive and manualized and standardized it and how it looks with a couple of case studies. One will be a high school case study for those of you in high school or secondary settings and one is an elementary. Um, and then we're gonna talk about what do you do if there's some additional considerations? What if you need a lot of help, uh, more expertise? When do, how does person center planning fit into this? When do we have to think about therapeutic interventions? So let's start with, um, I, thank goodness I don't have to talk about what an FBA BIP is because Kathleen covered that very nicely. So we have this table that you also can get um, in the one of the documents that is in the materials. There's a tier three blueprint or systems um, document that's a PDF that has a lot of information about what systems need to be in place in order to have an effective tier three uh, support or tier three support. And so how we look at this is I borrowed this actually and adapted it from Terry Scott and colleagues where they've taken a problem solving approach or multi-tiered approach to functional behavior assessment where the first column talks about the basic or more efficient approach. For example, um, Terry Scott and colleagues have a, a process called ERASE that some of you may be familiar with. And those are for mild discrete behaviors that happen very infrequently. Um, you have a smaller team. Um, it's primarily indirect measures of FBA. Uh, the behavior intervention plan focuses on teaching reinforcement strategies. Um, and you have the typical progress monitoring types of outcomes you're gonna be looking at. We're concerned with the middle part today, the comprehensive one, 
where this is uh, more when you have more intense challenging behaviors. I say when they occur often in multiple contexts, multiple environments, and you're not really quite sure of the function just by doing an interview. Um, it could have multiple functions. It could be the ones that we use with students who are nonverbal. Um, so the teams in the comprehensive approach tend to be larger teams because you're going to need more expertise. I think Kathleen did a nice job of explaining that. Um, we, in our process, when it's comprehensive, we define team roles so everyone knows what they're responsible to do. Um, and also we have processes to come to consensus because often when we're talking about students with problem behaviors or challenging behaviors, uh, we have very different opinions often on how we're going to approach and um, address things. And so we want to have a process where we all agree, even if we don't like the end result, we will all agree to move forward on this. Um, the functional behavior assessment should be both direct and indirect. Um, for those of you just a quick refresher, a direct op, uh, would be include direct observations, ABC kind of data collection, where somebody actually is looking at the student and collecting real live data um, to try to determine what are the triggers and what are the um, why the consequences that are maintaining that behavior. Indirect are things like checklists. Um, interviews where you don't actually have to see the child, um, but you're getting information from other people who have seen the child do the behavior. Um, so in this approach, we want to get both, which is why it will take a bit longer and involves more meetings because we're going to be problem solving and taking different data and making different decisions. The behavior intervention plan, similar to the basic one, is we do have multiple component plans, and we do stress that rather than making long, complicated plans um, that we just want to make sure that they're aligned with the hypothesis. And I'm going to show you how we do that so that we're able to address the prevent parts to prevent problem behavior. So those would be the triggers. We are going to teach a new behavior and reinforce that new behavior and we're all with the function. And then we're also going to have a plan on how we're going to address problem behavior so it no longer is maintained by the function. And then progress monitoring, not only do we get what we would get in the basic efficient progress monitoring, but we might also want to get some social validity and alliance. We want to see how acceptable is this to the teacher, how feasible, because teachers by and large are the implementers of the behavior intervention plans. If you don't have teacher buy-in and you don't have a plan that is possible for a teacher to implement in their authentic settings, it's not going to happen. Uh, so no matter how nice and technical some of us behavior analysts like to be, uh, sometimes our plans are not always going to be those plans that are suitable for teachers to be able to implement. So we're going to show you how we involve the teachers in that um, in a comprehensive approach. We might also want to see how um, did the teacher and the coach, who would be the person guiding and supporting the teacher, have a good relationship in which it's respectful and mutual and it seems to be collaborative. And we're still going to make database decision. For students who need more than uh, an FBA BIP, we have many students who have um, mental health needs or have specific conditions in which you need somebody with expertise to address it. For example, a psychological condition that needs intensive individualized support. That's where we may start going into wraparound and getting additional expertise, which is the third column. And we're not going to talk about that today because that goes, that could be an hour in and of itself. We're just going to show you a couple of things at the end that you could add to the FBA BIP process to intensify it even more for those individuals who need does um, sometimes out of school supports. One thing I talk about is what, when is an intervention individualized? Um, when we're talking about tier threes and um, multi-tier processes, sometimes it gets confusing as when is a tier two, when is a tier three, when is a tier one? Um, I don't stress about that. However, individualized interventions are those that I call customizable. They're developed to meet unique needs of one specific student. So they're not package approaches. The process in and of itself, such as an FBA, can be standardized. However, that behavior plan that gets developed for that one specific student should not look exactly like the behavior plan of the person you did previously. Each student will have their own unique needs that need to be addressed 
through your information gathering within your FBA, your hypothesis or summary statement that will then guide you to the interventions. Also, individualized interventions have assessment to intervention approaches. It's not, as I said, packaged. And so your FBA is your assessment that leads you to an intervention. So what are comprehensive FBA BIP features? you need to have collaborative systems or collaborative processes. Again, because the person who might be supporting the team to go through this process is not the person who's gonna be implementing the intervention plan, we really need to make sure that teachers and others are involved in this and that we honor their needs and their um, realistic situations in which what the, are they capable of doing and what do they need support on? So we have to have collaborative approaches. Um, as said earlier in the slot, in the previous slide, this needs to be customizable. There has to be an ability to make it fit that individual student's needs and that teacher's feasibility to be able to implement an intervention. It needs to be coachable. So it should be so well described, for example, that we can coach the teacher to implement the plan. We can coach others to learn how to do this process. And again, the contextual fit. In interventions will not be implemented if teachers think they're unable to do it. The other thing that I talk about is in high school, especially in middle school, the contextual fit also has to be considered of the student because if a student doesn't wanna be involved in whatever intervention you're providing, then you're, you may have a willing teacher, but the student's going to refuse to participate in that intervention. So you also wanna think about how you might get um, the student in this collaborative process and get their willingness and their input on what's gonna work. So these are the steps we do in our comprehensive FBA BIP approaches. So whether you decide to adopt some of PTR or you do um, something else, you would be able to um, apply these steps. So the first one is you wanna get your team together, identify who your team is, de determine how you're going to work as a team. We're then gonna to want to identify, prioritize and define those behaviors targeted for our intervention. We wanna um, make sure we have some way to have a daily progress monitoring method. We wanna have um, a way to get our FBA um, and do our FBA and develop the hypothesis from it. We wanna then take that hypothesis and develop and implement a behavior intervention plan. We wanna make sure there's active coaching provided to support the teacher to implement the behavior intervention plan and then provide ongoing performance feedback. And we want to have database decision making processes. So we're going to show you an example of an approach that's comprehensive. It's called Prevent, Teach, Reinforce, or PTR. And this is the model of PTR. So the first thing is this box in the middle, the student team. We, de we determine who is on the team, not by um, their, their actual job title, but instead by their knowledge level. So we want a coach on the team and the coach is a person who has the knowledge of functional behavior assessment principles, applied behavioral analysis upon which the whole science of FBA BIP is based on. So we want to have a coach who is able to not only have that technical knowledge, but also has good communication skills and collaboration abilities to be able to take a team through the process. We want members who know the student well, so that would be teacher, parents, other staff members who see the student's behavior and can answer questions about what is triggering the behavior and why is the behavior being maintained. And then we also wanna have members who know the school and the district, so they know the resources, they know policies, procedures. Then we start going into the steps that actually line up with those seven steps that we just talked about. So the first step of PTR is you're gonna identify and define and prioritize your behaviors. We're then gonna develop a daily progress monitoring system. It takes the teacher five seconds to do every single day. We're gonna analyze the behavior problem by conducting an FBA BIP on each behavior that's been prioritized. We're going to develop that hypothesis from the information that we get. We're then going to select and develop a multi-component intervention plan that links to the hypothesis. 
This step also includes the act of coaching of the teacher to make sure the teacher implements the plan with fidelity and gets support throughout implementation with the student. And then we're going to go within three weeks, we're gonna look at progress monitoring data um, as well as the fidelity of implementation of the plan data and then make next step decisions. And we may be going through this cycle or parts of this cycle continuously until um, we have either have no longer any need for individualized supports and we can um, transition maybe solely to tier two or tier one supports or we have new behaviors that we have to identify and address. We do have research at PTI. I'm not going to bore you with all of it. I, at the very end, I have a list of several publications. Um, there is a manual also for PTR. There's a manual for kindergarten through eighth, kinder, elementary, basically, uh, a manual for young children, and one for family PTR. And they're all um, like in the family of Brooks Publishing. However, I also provided you with more than what the book gives you on the materials you have a handout that is PTR tools. They're all the tools that you're gonna see throughout this session, as well as tools that I'm not gonna show. Um, they're all available for you. And you're, you have my permission to use every single one of those. So there have been two randomized controlled trials on PTR. Um, and then there have been several single subject studies that are looking at applying PTR in multiple contexts with different types of students. So we have a pretty well-rounded uh, research agenda right now that shows PTR at, is um, effective. So in the randomized controlled trial, students who received PTR significantly improved social skills, academic engaged time and their behaviors compared to those students who did not receive PTR. And all of the single subject studies that have been conducted the PTR has improved the dependent variable, whatever it was, usually it was behaviors and all those studies. In all these um, studies as well, we get fidelity and teachers inter implement the interventions with high 80% or greater fidelity. And both teachers and students find PTR to be socially valid. In the high school studies and middle school studies, we do get student feedback on how well they liked PTR and would they wanna do it again. So let's talk about some of the first steps in a comprehensive approach. So in PTR or any approach that you're going to use, I like to look at a couple of different formations of teams. Um, I like the idea of having a, an extended team that meets occasionally, not as often as that core team in green. The extended team would be that larger team that would include the teacher who referred the student as well as the student, other teachers who are vested in success for the student, the coach, any other staff who might not be teaching the student but might be administrators or other support people, and then family members. They meet us frequently, but they provide important input and support to the teacher in implementing the intervention and help make some um, broader database decisions. The core team though is where most of the action happens, uh, especially after we select the behavior interventions that will be put into the behavior plan. That is where the teacher and the coach and then the student as well may be involved in this core team where they meet frequently to figure out how they're gonna develop the interventions, um, what it's going to look like in the setting in which it's gonna be implemented. Um, that teacher will then get direct active coaching and you can make immediate decisions after observing implementation of the plan and doing performance feedback on what needs to be changed right then and there in order to make something work better. We also, um, whether you do PTR or you do your own um, model of FBA BIP, it's always nice to have agendas at those meetings. Um, and PTR, the series of steps usually um, involve different meetings. So your first meeting would be meeting to identify the behaviors of concern and set up your behavior progress monitoring system. And this would be an example of um, the agenda that we would use for the very first meeting. Then the other thing talking about the collaborative process and PTR when we do identifying behaviors, the coach has a very important role. The coach does not tell the team 
the behaviors they're going to target or give their opinion on you should do this behavior versus that behavior. Instead, the, the coach guides the team to reach consensus on those behaviors to be targeted. How we do it is around, typically is in a round robin type of a fashion. So what um, I often do when I do this process is, or when I train others to do the process is, I have the team members there, and you can see the coaches in the middle. And this is an example of a form that we provide to each of the team members to have while we're doing the meeting and we'll have it displayed as well on our LCD. And we'll ask the team, first of all, at the top where it says behaviors to decrease and where it says target behavior, everybody write down between one to three behaviors you would like to see less of from the student. So give them about two minutes to do that. And then we go around the circle of everybody on the team to say, what behavior did you have down on yours? And I'm write it down. What behavior did you have on? What you see happening during this process is people will say, oh, I have that behavior. And I also have this behavior. Or I have that behavior, but I called it that. Um, parents enjoy this process because they get to fully participate. And what's nice about this is everybody gets a chance to provide input. You know how in some meetings, some people talk all the time, that would be me, um, and then other people are quiet all the time and you have to actually ask them or force them to talk. This way, everybody talks, but they have such a specific task that it's not an embarrassment to talk. They can just say, okay, here's the behavior I have, or I agree with that person. We just go round and round until there are no more behaviors. And then we then ask the team to help us winnow down those behaviors. So some of these behaviors, really the same behaviors, let's define them in observable and measurable terms. Now that we have problem behaviors winnowed down and we agree on the definitions, let's everybody on their piece of paper or on a post-it note, write down if we could um, address one behavior and by addressing that one behavior and we reduce it, it will make every day a better day for everybody. Which behavior would it be? And then we get, we collect those and see which, but we, actually which behavior gets the most votes. And then we talk about it and make sure everybody's in agreement. Oh, everybody, five people out of six said cussing was the behavior that they think we should target. That would make everybody's day a better day if we could reduce the cussing behavior. Is everybody okay with that? Even the person who didn't select that. And most often people are very much okay with whatever that is. And then no one feels bad that, oh, they didn't pick my behavior because they can clearly see that there's a consensus here that more people are seeming to select this behavior. And then we do the same thing for now, what are behaviors you'd like to see the student do more of instead of cussing? And so the same process. So you can see this takes a little bit more time than just having people say behaviors. However, you're able to get everybody to be on the same page, which is very important. We also have a student version for high school, when we were talking about high school kids, how it's very important to make sure you have their buy-in in this process uh, because they can definitely turn off and not be part of all. So we take a little bit, that first on the left is just five questions from person-centered planning type questions where we first wanna, um, we always interview the student. We don't have them typically sit in the meeting because um, that doesn't always go so well. And students feel a little bit like um, everybody's talking about them. So this is a little bit better get their input outside of the team meeting. We ask them a little bit so like, what are your goals? What are your dreams? What could help you reach your dream? Um, what's keeping you from your dream? And so what this is going to get is, recognizing what's already in place that's supporting them and maybe some things that they recognize, oh, I need to do this or I might need some more help or this might be what happens. And then what are some big important choices because a lot of self-determination um, things, we find out that kids with disabilities tend to not have a lot of choices or kids with very significant behavior problems tend to have less choice opportunities. And then who are the people in their life? We often find that for number five, people with, um, challenging behaviors often don't have as many people in their lives outside of people who are paid to be with them or because they're family, they have to be with them. Um, and so some of those might be broader goals we're going to do. And then we have a process where we ask the student, tell, you tell us um, what are behaviors you wish you'd do more, less of and what are some behaviors you wish you would do more of. 
Sometimes what we do for some students who aren't going to be real talkative is we might first meet with the adults and then bring the adult behaviors in that they want to see more of and less of and ask the student, which ones do you agree with, with the larger team and which ones do you disagree with? So this is our elementary students I'm gonna use for the case study. This is um, a, a bigger version of his actual team that they came up with. And the things that are italicized and bold are the prioritized behavior. So for Jeff, and I do wanna say Jeff probably could have benefited from the basic um, process that was described by Kathleen, uh, but he does have a cool plan, so I'd like to use him. And I also like to show that general education students can have comprehensive FBA BIPs if necessary. So he's a general ed second grader. Um, they decided disruptive behaviors is their name of the behavior, but you can see that there, um, the description of it is, um, I call pretty mild compared to some of the other kids that I have. I sometimes show my student with autism, but I decide not to today and to go with Jeff's plan instead on uh, Jeff's case. Uh, so you can see it's basically, he basically tell you what uh, about Jeff is, Jeff's a, a repeat second grader and Jeff failed second grade because he never finished a writing assignment. Um, instead of writing, he does all those behaviors you see on this definition and he is in danger of being referred to special education because he, he has the cognitive abilities and the educational abilities, but he hates writing and he just won't write. Uh, so that was one of their big concerns and this is the behaviors he does when he has writing typically. Um, and then what they wanted to see instead they targeted was on task behavior and independent work completion. And you can see how they described the definition of on-task behavior. Now this is by got the, the um, coach helps guide them and ask questions to get to the best um, measurable and observable definition. Okay, we then do a progress monitoring system. Uh, we call it the IBERS, the Individualized Behavior Rating Scale um, tool for teachers. And this is a direct behavior rating, very similar for to the um, Daily, uh, daily point record card and check in, check out, except it's an individualized um, progress monitoring where teachers merely circle a rating to indicate what that behavior looked like for the day. So here's an example of Jeff's eye burst. Um, is the disruption, if you look at the columns here and the rows, the first row is for his disruptive behavior that was identified as the primary behavior to decrease each column in this particular IBER stands for a different day. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, if we want to put all those dates there. And what they do is down here, it tells you how it's going to be rated. Teacher can decide I'm gonna rate this only during one period or one routine or during a specific time, or I'm gonna do it across the entire day at the end of the day, say overall across the day, how was the behavior? The teacher guided by the coach sets up what a five means, which five always means a lot of behavior. So a lot of challenging behavior, if it's an appropriate behavior, a lot of the appropriate behavior. A one always means not very much of the behavior. So a one for a problem behavior is we're not seeing it a whole lot, that's what we wanna see. Um, and for appropriate behavior, a one is we're not seeing very much, we wanna see more of the behavior. So what's nice about this is you can, you can um, connect the dots and you wanna see appropriate behaviors, graph and the line go up, problem behaviors, we want to see the graph go down. And so the coach guides the teacher to develop this and then will um, be able to, at the end of that day, or the period that they um, indicated they want to take the measurement, circle, what did the behavior look like? What's a five here, meaning it was a really, really challenging day. It was a day I think I wanted to go to Walmart and be a greeter and just quit this job. Um, or I had to go and um, have some, some medicinal treatment at home that, that night because of this five. Um, and a four is usually a typical bad day, a three is a so-so day, a two is a good day, and a one is a fantastic day. Uh, we do the, the kind of the scale so that teachers can kind of have anchors and 
frequency or duration or latency or however they want to use this um, in order to be able to give some substance to these bad days, fantastic days, good days. And so you can see this is how we did set this up for Jeff. We also have another student, we called him Deonta, he's from high school. Um, now, this is a student that uh, one of the graduate students in our applied behavior analysis program did as part of her thesis. So I don't have all of the information as to why I don't have his goal. I didn't have his goal setting sheet to show you because she didn't provide that in her thesis. And she's no longer with us, so I can't always get all the stuff that she had. Uh, but they, I did have her eye burst. And this is the eye burst uh, for Deontay just to uh, describe him. He's a high school student who has an emotional dis disturbance. So he is in a self-contained classroom with um, all boys who are I think it was all boys. There might've been one girl, but basically mostly boys in this classroom with a teacher and a couple of aides. And so the behaviors they were targeting was they wanted to see less disrespect, which is he was calling teachers by their first name. He was demanding them to come over here, um, saying things like come here, whining no every time a teacher would say something, touching the teacher property without permission. That was really getting that teacher. Um, and so this one, they took it, as you can see, only during first period. And it was frequency. How many times did he have this um, disrespectful statements? And then what they wanted to teach him to do instead is have appropriate social interactions with the teacher. So these are the different, as you can see, this is the definition down here. This takes, that takes five seconds for the teacher to, to rate. So here's your first poll. I am, um, it is what tier three data progress monitoring methods are used in your settings. So if everybody could please go to the poll and vote. And somebody could tell me, because um, I'll have to take it off slideshow to actually <laughs> see the polls. <laughs> okay, so far, Rose, we have 39% direct observation, 12% standard assessments, 31 direct behavior ratings, five something like the eye burst, and 12% wing it. <laughs> well, I'm one of those 12 percent. I just love that. <laughs> kind of let you know it's okay if you don't have something in place. Uh, one of the things that the with the eye burst is we uh, actually test it out during the meeting and have the teacher after they develop it with um, the team and the coach. We ask them to test it out right then and there and how would they rate that student that day or the day before. And teachers, once they use it, say, oh my gosh, that was kind of easy. I like this. So we've only had a couple of teachers who have not liked this. You could even train students to use this um, IBERS. So then we do an FBA BIP um, hypothesis. In all comprehensive approaches, you're going to want to get several sources. Um, so you're not going to want to just do an interview or just do an observation. You want to get information from multiple people who are familiar with the student because those different lenses of information can help provide more data on what is, what are the triggers and why, more importantly, why are those triggers um, triggering the behavior? And why is the behavior being maintained? What are we, how are we responding um, to understand why the student continues to do the behaviors? So we do combination and the hypothesis should integrate all of the data that is um, approached. And then we final hypothesis should get consensus from the team that that sounds accurate. So in PTR, we do have an interview checklist. You have it in your tools. You have uh, several different versions. They're not only, um, this is the elementary version and it is aligned with prevent, teach, reinforce. So there's a couple of pages that ask about prevent, which are antecedent or trigger events that both um, elicit problem behavior and predict it, as well as those triggers that predict appropriate or an absence of problem behavior. 
Um, we, we have, then you also have the teach, which where the, the team can say, do I think that the student is doing this to escape, to get attention, to get an object, to get away from a task, to get away from a person? And then we have a reinforce section, which asks the team, what are the typical responses that follow the problem behavior? What do the teachers do? What do the peers do? Um, does the student really like uh, be, have, be, having attention? It's real important for secondary students because sometimes they don't like even reinforce. They don't like to have uh, reinforcement being delivered where everybody else can hear it. Um, so that is asking questions about consequences and strategies. We have a version to use for high school where the student has multiple teachers and there's going to be some different um, antecedents or different ways of saying them. So it's not so elementary. And we also have a student interview or student version. So no matter whether you use PTR or any comprehensive approach, I highly recommend that you have a, a way to get data from the student. We find out um, so much from the student that we would never know just by observing because the student actually can give us information on what are they thinking and uh, what is prompting them to do what they're doing. And then we don't use the competing behavior pathway. There's no reason you don't because you can use that in a comprehensive approach as well as the basic approach as described by Kathleen. Um, we do this, um, we call this an assessment organization table. This is a cheat sheet that when we do training. Uh, it tells exactly uh, from the assessment where to put the information and what box, and then what box is used at the bottom to make your hypothesis. So um, we just a little bit, we wanna make sure that everybody knows the functions of behavior. There's two, it's either positive reinforcements, get. Um, so you're trying to get specific activities, attention of people, maybe a specific task or specific tangible, uh, little kids maybe um, want a specific toy or something like that to play with. For some of our kids who have um, intellectual deficits or autism, it might be they want to get some sensory stimulation. Um, there may be some pain attenuation that is with um, very cognitively delayed people, or then we are trying to have negative reinforcement or escape or avoid or terminate or delay um, some of the same things. So we have a couple of polls here. So first, second poll, name that function. Uh, what is the function of this child's carpal tunnel syndrome behavior, where the mom comes to him and says, doing additions and subtractions doesn't cause carpal tunnel syndrome. So if you could go to that poll and select what you think would be the best function of this behavior. Rows of responses coming in, it, I see 98% believe it's to get out of, and 97% and 3% believe it's to get. Well, this is such a smart group of attendees we have. Man, you're all honor, you're already a behavior analyst or an honorable behavior analyst. I would agree. Of course, this is a very uh, basic cartoon. So there could be a lot of other things. And for those of you that said attention, you know, it could also be attention have multiple functions because while he is escaping doing math, he is getting attention from mom, right? Uh, so there could be some things with multiple functions going on here. However, uh, one thing you wanna do in a comprehensive approach is try very hard to identify what might be the primary function. Um, you can also address the secondary functions in your behavior intervention plan, but you wanna make sure that you are at least addressing the primary function um, because some, sometimes when we address the secondary function or an incorrect function, um, our plans don't work as well. Okay, one more poll, and I think it's the last poll because I decided that uh, we'd be pulled out by now, or at least I would be. So it's the same thing. What function do you think is the behavior of this girl um, screaming? So she's in a store with her dad. Can I have dad? No, sweetheart, not today. Mommy and daddy can't afford to buy you a toy every time you come to the store. She lets out a scream. She gets home with a toy, shows her mom, look. Her mom goes, you bought her another toy? And dad goes, no, the rest of the people in line took up a collection. Votes are still coming in, so I'm going to give them just a second. Mm -hmm. 
I think we're about at 94% to get and 6% to get out of. Okay. Well, I the, those people who said to get, I agree with you. She is screaming to get that toy, right? <laughs> or some of you might be saying, well, she's trying to get out of the no. And I can see that kind of thinking. Uh, but I have seen this child at Target, by the way. Uh, so I know we are all familiar with that. So a little bit of fun to just think about the, um, the function. It's very important, though, to try to figure this out because you know the word functions in functional behavior assessment. So the function is extremely important. And that function helps guide what your intervention plan is going to look like. So when I showed you that assessment organization table, here's an example of Jeff's assessment organization table. Um, and I was on his team. I was the coach for his team, which is why I have all the information for Jeff. But you can see that his team primarily um, said these are the triggers of his problem behavior. And it was basically the demands to start things he didn't like that were writing or any tasks that required a writing, such as math that had a lot of problems written down or um, social studies where he had to answer questions and write, anything that was repetitive and anything that uh, seemed to last a long time. Um, more often in independent seek work than in group activities. And um, then that's when he would, they thought it was primarily delay in avoiding those um, difficult tasks because what they tended to do was change his activity a lot. Sometimes given personal space, which is their nice term for maybe sending him to the corner of the room or somewhere uh, where um, he got to escape the task. Sometimes they move into a different seat because he, the, that um, definition of his behavior is he tended to bother the peers around him. Um, they also sent the homework to the home for homework, the work home for homework. Um, and his parents were not happy at all about that. So let me tell you that about that a little bit later. We have time and how happy they were after the intervention uh, because they felt kind of like, why are we having to do this work at home? Why aren't you doing it at school? Why aren't the teachers making you do that? And you know how that goes. And then we also down at the bottom look at when is it least likely to happen. And this is a boy after my own heart, as you can see, least likely anything that didn't involve work. You didn't see any of these peer disruptions or this um, disruptive behavior. The, the middle one, again, is just looking at what kind of things might we teach him to have him be um, more successful academically, as well as replace that behavior. Um, that is problematic. And then what are some other things besides function that we might use for reinforcement. And so here's his hypothesis. In our PTR version, we like to do both an inappropriate behavior and appropriate behavior, place of behavior hypothesis, so that teachers understand the concept of why we get the function. So the top one is just taking the information that this appears to most likely be when he's presented with demands to start some non-preferred academic tasks, specifically those that are independent. He does this behavior, and as a result, he avoids or delays the task. In the appropriate behavior hypothesis, we still have the same trigger because he's going to be asked to do these tasks um, and we have the same function. But what we wanna show teachers and the team is instead of doing this behavior, the disruptive behavior to avoid or delay the task, instead we want him to be academically engaged and complete the tasks. And as a result of doing that, he's gonna get some avoidance or delay. And we're gonna show you in his plan how the team came up with how they were gonna provide him escape based on being engaged. This is their high school students hypothesis. Um, what they discovered in their FBA when he has minimal work to do, he's requested to do a task or when he doesn't have direct teacher attention, that's when he tends to engage in those disrespectful interactions. And it seemed to be that he was doing it because he liked attention from adults because they would respond with a lot of verbal interactions. Um, or he liked to be able to have the adult, preferred adults do activities with him. And that was the only way he knew how to get that to happen. And so it's appropriate behavior hypothesis instead of when he's in these situations of engaging disrespectful interactions, we're gonna have him engage in appropriate social interactions. And as a result, that's how he'll get attention. So now in step three of any comprehensive approach, we now link the hypothesis and do intervention plans. So comprehensive plans have multiple components. We're going to have something to prevent, something to teach, reinforce with the function, 
and then respond to problem behavior in different ways so that the student no longer ha has challenging behavior to get the function. Instead, they do the appropriate behavior. Um, the behavior intervention plan should be so well described that teachers are able to implement. So in PTR, we don't go with a large number. We just say you only have to have one prevent, one teach, and then two responding behaviors, one to respond to the replacement behavior and one to respond to the challenging behaviors. And we carefully task analyze all of those strategies with the teacher so that they work in her or his context. Uh, we also work with the student if they're older to make sure that this is going to be acceptable and understood for the student. So that should be so well written that a substitute could come in and do the plan perfectly. Um, also in comprehensive approaches, teachers need support and we wanna have that coaching support provided. Now in PTR, how we do this is we have a menu of interventions that are selected by the team and the coach makes sure and ensures that what the team selects is matched with the hypothesis. So we have them rank order interventions and then we go with the one that seems to be in agreement with most of the team members and also is in agreement with the teacher who's going to implement it. And then the coach works with the teacher to develop a task analysis of the top strategy from each category. And again, there's the um, minimum components or parts of strategies we have. So this is an example of the checklist that we use in our elementary version. You can see there's a prevent, teach, and then reinforcement. Anything that has two stars next to it means they can't skip it, they have to do it. Even if they don't check anything there, we come, we circle back around and say, okay, let's talk about how you're going to teach that re, uh, the replacement behavior. And the replacement behavior tends to be the one that they wanna see more of that they said in the, in the previous meeting and that we're doing the data collection on. Um, and again, it's rank order. We take the top ones. We also ask, as you can see near the bottom, does the student need a safety plan because their behavior could be ha potential harmful um, to the student or others? This is a look at the secondary version. So same concept, they just have some different um, names of strategies or additional strategies that aren't available for the elementary because we know these are all evidence-based by the way, in the book we do give citations for each of these interventions. So you're using evidence-based interventions. And then this is the student version. So we do ask the student to rank order and tell us which ones are gonna be the ones they would be okay with having um, implemented with them by their teacher in their classroom. They can either do this by the coach or the interviewer explaining to them the difference between these and asking them which ones they're okay with and which ones, you know, cross through the ones you definitely don't want to have happen. Um, we can also take what the adult said and say of these, which one would you be willing to do and which ones would you not be willing to do. So it can be either way. Um, and we try to do a match between which one the student says that they will are willing to do and maybe would most like with the top one that matches with the student um, that the teacher and the team said. Uh, so it may not always be the top one on either list, but it'll be the one that both parties said, we're willing to do this one. So here's an example of Jeff, our retained second graders plan. I'm not gonna go through the entire plan because you all know how to read. Um, just wanna notice that what the team selected, again, we have this one prevent intervention. We don't have to have a lot. They decided choice making. Remember Jeff's um, antecedent was presenting him with a non-preferred task, something that was very in uh, independent and had writing to do it. So choice making is a great intervention that matches that um, hypothesis because he has a little bit more of a say in how that non-preferred task might be delivered or performed. And then that makes him a little bit more willing to engage in that task and maybe less aversive to avoid it. And you can see there's an example. We always usually start with a description and then the, here are the things that we work with the teacher and how we get these steps is where the coach will ask the teacher, okay, so here's the type of choices that you're going to do. Um, we got a lot of different ones. So when do you wanna provide the choice? Right before you give him the task, which is listed in the hypothesis, 
or right after. In this particular plan, the teachers decided they wanted to only do the intervention during the 50 minute writing period that they had right before um, lunch every single morning. So this intervention is only for 40, 50 minutes. And during that routine, we like to start with routines because it's less overwhelming for the teacher to try to dress the entire day. And then if this is successful, we can think about how we can expand it to other routines if there are still behaviors occurring there. And so this, this you can see that they said when they want to do it before the writing assignment, then once you prevent, present the choice, what are you going to say? So we often write scripts for the teacher. And by we get the script from to asking the teacher, what, what do you want to say? How do you want to ask the student? Because they know the student better than I know the student, and they know the words that they can use that will work with that student. And then what do you want to do after Jeff makes the choice? This is a nice opportunity to give him some positive reinforcement. Now they also select an environmental sport, but this came after the teach strategy. So they didn't select this at the first go around, but once we described how we were gonna teach them to be engaged, they then realized they wanted to have a timer. So we just added is, because we wanted to make sure they understood how again to use the timer. So you can see even something as simple as a timer, you think, well, why do you have to go through this? This is the beauty of very comprehensive approaches is we don't take anything for granted. When we ask the teacher a whole lot of questions, how do you wanna do it? When do you wanna do this? How are you gonna set it? What are you going to say? Um, and then teachers then are able to implement the plan because they have a, a scheme or a map here of how to do it. So what we decided to do, or they decided to do is they were gonna teach him to be engaged and they're gonna reinforce him with escape because remember he has a function of escape and they decide they weren't going to teach him to ask for a break, which a lot of you are probably saying, why didn't they just teach him to say, I need a break? Well, they're, these are general education teachers. They weren't too crazy about that. Uh, so they went with this route instead. They made this little um, kind of sheet for him. Uh, they had a goal for him for completing his writing assignment. Every day they'd start off and you will read in the behavior intervention plan that we describe when are they gonna discuss this with him, how many minutes he's going to take to complete that assignment, that um, writing assignment that day. Here is the behavior that he is to do. He has to raise his hand to speak. He has to keep his pencil upright. He has to let his neighbors work. They also combined that we want to see him actually write. So um, they divided the writing assignment up into starter sentence, detail sentence, conclusion statement. And what he is to do is while he at the end of the writing period, he then with the teacher goes over all of this. You have a starter sentence. If yes, let's put a check here, detail sentence and so on. So for every single thing here, he earns, uh, he gets a check. Now, what does he get to do with these checks? Every check he gets, he gets one of these dots. See these dots here? And then you have um, the teacher would cut them into strips and then across. So every dot would be all by itself, keep on a sticky backy. Jeff has an envelope up next to his desk. The dots go in his envelope. What can he do with the dots? He can escape work with the dots. So as soon as he has dots, very next time he has a writing assignment or a math assignment or a comprehension assignment, if he sees something he doesn't want to do, he can take a dot out of his envelope, take it off its sticky backing and stick it over that question, that writing um, assignment or whatever the uh, task item is. And the teacher is going to say, yep, you can go ahead and escape it. Now, when he runs out of dots, which when we taught Jeff this, he did ask, could he use all of his dots on one paper? And we said, yes, you could. But you know, once you're out of dots, then you're gonna have to do everything else. But then he said, but then I know how to get more dots. I have to do the starter sentence, detail sentence, conclusion statement, and be on task. So he got it instantly. And I'm gonna tell you, he hoarded his dots. He never used his dots because they also, general ed teachers are always gonna ask, well, what about the other kids? They don't get any dots and they're not going to escape. So we talked about, well, what do we want to do? Do we want to reinforce everybody? Is there a way to do this? This could be a win-win situation for everyone. Um, and so what they came up with is if Jeff met his daily goal, then he would earn a mystery motivated letter for a class-wide reinforcement for the class and it'll be a bonus. And they did tell me that after they started doing this intervention, he earned um, the, the uh, mystery motivator reinforcement for the class in record time that year, because he was so charged up by that he was actually 
finishing writing. I remember one time I came in for a um, fidelity coaching session. They came running to the door saying this is the first time he got to editing. He actually finished a paper, was able to edit. So this describes how he's reinforced. Again, the steps are the task analysis that we work with the teacher. And then that's how he's, they're gonna reinforce um, the whole class. And then here's how they're gonna respond if he starts having disruptive behavior. And it's basically, they're gonna redirect him to use his replacement behavior, which is to be academic engaged or to use one of his dogs. This is Deontay's high school behavior intervention plan. I'm gonna show you this is exactly the same way. The only difference um, that we have is of course, what what the plan is, uh, but the process is the same. And we get a lot more involvement of Deontay with uh, the teacher in what this plan is going to look like. So they decided to do uh, a whole classified management, which is um, unbelievable, they selected that, I was so happy, but they decided to do a whole poster. And Deontay liked Pan the Panda, favorite, his favorite song. I'm gonna tell you, I am not aware of what Panda song is, so I, probably would have been not so good in this, uh, this thing, but they used the acronym to say how he was going to talk to the teacher and do their replacement behavior. Um, and they were gonna do visual cues. And that is the visual cue, the poster that they use with the panda bear. Um, one of the funny thing is, is all the students started using this and saying, telling the other kids, hey, you need to panda it. Um, anytime one of those students started being more disruptive or rude. And then this is how um, he was going to be taught to do this. And here and you can see there's the steps down there that the teacher is going to do to implement this intervention. And then here's how he's going to be reinforced. It's going to be with attention because that's his function, his attention. And how are we going to discontinue um, reinforcement, which means how are we going to respond when he does do those disrespectful behaviors to the adults? Okay, you can read these plans, you have them, because um, I promised I was gonna to try to finish by 2.45 so you could have questions. Uh, so then this is the coaching process. A lot of what they described in the basic um, FBA is very similar to what we do in coaching. And here's just why I love this, um, because PowerPoints like these don't tend to be very good in awareness, um, but they aren't very good for implementation. So I'm back from training. I got a big binder. The training's already forgotten, but the binder will last forever, a living monument to temporary knowledge. I confess I have lots of binders on my um, bookshelf that I haven't opened for years. Uh, so that's very true. So we use behavior skills training to do our coaching. Um, we, this includes that we will provide instructions. We then model for the teacher how to do things. Uh, we have the teacher rehearse by doing role playing. And then we do teacher reflection forms to get feedback and as well as observations. So that is our sequence. This is an example of a coaching plan as well as could be a fidelity plan. So this is Jeff's intervention plan. But what we've done is we've now narrowed it down to what are the core behaviors of the intervention that we would see the teacher do if we were observing the teacher doing this. So you can see now we take that plan that has a lot of information into a one page um, quick cheat sheet. Teacher can self-assess fidelity and observer can use this assess fidelity. When we go in and coach the teacher, we have them use this in order to help practice and role play. We also get, as you see in the third column, once they start implementing this with the student, they can gauge for each of the interventions they selected what impact they thought that intervention had on Jeff's behavior. This is an example of the implementation reflection form. Before we do our um, performance feedback, we either ask the teacher to complete this or we ask the teacher these questions because we don't want teachers to feel like coaching is a punishment. Um, we also describe for coaches, we have a coaching manual. I didn't upload that, but if people want it, they can probably, I have an email, just let me know, and I'd be happy to send it to you, or if enough people want, I can post it, or we describe how to be a coach. Um, and one of the things that we know coaches don't often have um, as much awareness of is how do you provide feedback to teachers or somebody who's an adult or a peer without kind of making it seem like it's, it's um, negative. And so we go through this we call it sometimes the coaching feedback sandwich. We always start with a positive statement and end with a positive statement. But you can see here as we go through, let's get a positive reflection, what's working well, 
what now is still challenging is the third, as for reflection on areas for improvement. So rather than say what didn't go well or what we observed them doing that wasn't correct, instead of make, putting it on the teacher, we just ask them, well, what was challenging? What's challenging about implementing this plan? And that's how we get to those areas that they might not be doing with high fidelity. And then we problem solve what we might do to make it work better. Okay, and then for progress monitoring, uh, so we like to, it's, you know, hard and fast rule, but we would suggest you have regular progress monitoring meetings where you bring the team back, the whole team, that extended team that I talked about, to look at the data. And we think that for individualized um, supports, it should be every three to four weeks because you don't want a teacher doing a plan for months and months with it not working and not having a meeting. Those are the teachers gonna ask for that student to be removed from their classroom. So we wanna keep on looking at the data and make adjustments as possible based on the data. And we look at both implementation fidelity as well as um, student outcome data. And you can see here, this is a flow chart for those who don't like place charts. We also have a, um, in your tools handout, there is a step-by-step -step process for what you ask the team based on the data and where you go. But this just kind of goes with, what are you gonna do if the data, student outcome data is showing that the student's behavior is improving? You say, yes, here's some decisions you might make. You could extend the plan. Like for Jeff, we would extend the plan to other routines since they were only doing it in writing. Um, for Deontay, it might be because they're, we're only doing it during specific periods. Maybe we do it um, in other periods besides first period. Um, and then if we say no, then what we're going to look at before we do anything with the plan is, are we implementing the plan as intended? If we say yes, we have some decisions to make. If we say no, there's other decisions we make. And then we go through this again. Um, here are, is Jeff's data. So they were only doing the intervention during writing, which is 40, 50 minutes out of the day. However, the um, eye burst was for overall the entire day. So the teacher completed this at the end of the day. And you can see that even though they only did this for 40 minutes of the day, they had nice impact on Jeff's behavior. His disruptive behavior decreased his appropriate behavior increased, which is what we want to see. Um, what we would do with these data if he wasn't a research subject and he instead was an actual, um, I was the, the behavior analyst assigned to this school, is we would start looking at extending this because it's successful, but there's still going to be other times of the day where he's still being disruptive because we're not doing the intervention in any other class other than writing, then we want to extend it. And they did decide that the following year they were going to do it both writing and in math because math was another area he was showing that behavior. This is Deontay. So now this is um, um, the, t the student because we require them to have observation data as part of their thesis because they're in the applied behavior analysis program. Uh, so these, these are her direct observations of Deontay. Um, the black squares are the problem behavior. We want to see those go down. Um, the White circles are the appropriate interactions. So this one is um, not as impressive as we would like because Deontay, while his disrespectful behaviors went down, his respectful um, interactions did not increase as much as we would hope. Um, so if we were going to stay there, we'd want to address why is that happening? And my guess is, I think in talking with the with um, our student who did the thesis, she was saying they there were a couple of um, things that were giving him a lot of opportunities or they weren't reinforcing as um, promptly to his appropriate behaviors as they did respond to problem behaviors. Uh, this is interesting though, for our teacher perception. So this is the eye burst ratings. These are again, the disrespectful interactions. So look what the teacher's perceptions were of the behavior. And again, the teacher looks at this every day whereas our student only came in during occasional um, observations. Um, they saw an improved, a drastic improvement in the appropriate adult interactions. They actually perceived that he was doing a great job on that. Um, okay, so we, I'm, I'm gonna take two minutes and we'll have 10 minutes for questions. So I apologize, I took five more minutes than I wanted to. One of the things that we wanna talk about with tier three, which again, this should be its own topic, this more advanced um, interventions that maybe go beyond functional behavior assessment. Because functional behavior assessment, in my opinion, is the core practice for tier three. However, we have many students 
who need much more than a functional behavior assessment. So for some students, specifically those who are nonverbal, who have um, intellectual disabilities, long being with nonverbal, may have such severe behaviors as self-injurious behaviors or physically aggressive behaviors, where you might actually need to have somebody to come in to do what's called a functional analysis and have that expertise to try to stimulate conditions and try to narrow down what is the function of this behavior. Because our um, FBA models that are both direct and indirect might not really be intensive enough to get that. Um, we also know that, especially as we get uh, uh, older students, there's a lot of mental health needs, psychological needs. So have students who are borderline or bipolar or have anxiety or depression, girls who are cutting, having eating disorders, an FBA and a BIP could supplement or maybe kind of help, but it's not going to be the treatment. So one of the things that is in the tier three systems um, or the tier three blueprint that you have is talking about when do you make decisions about when do you bring in this expertise and how do you get this expertise? Is it in-house expertise where you start inviting other agencies to the table to be there to, to help with the interventions? Because our school psychologists are fantastic. Not every school psychologist is going to have the expertise to do these therapeutic interventions that for these um, specific disorders. You wanna make sure that if you have a student where their behavior is actually being impacted by things that might be beyond school and are impacting their quality of life. So kids who are homeless, kids who, especially in COVID-19, who are having a lot of issues. Their parents have lost their jobs and they don't have enough money for food. Um, we're gonna need to rely a lot more on, we need to bring in social workers to help us identify those resources and how to support the whole family and other agencies. And then finally, person-centered planning processes are always great things to bring the whole team together, including those people who are outside of the school um, who are going to support and wrap supports around the student. This is a photo, um, a, a screenshot of a person center plan that we did for a student with autism a couple of years ago. And uh, if you wanna know more about this process, please feel, feel free to email me or Dawn who can, can is actually our king of person center planning approaches. I learned how to do person center planning from Dawn. Um, and this is really just to get at what is the dream of the student and what are the goals that we're gonna do and the team can go beyond what's happening in school. So for example, this student has autism and needs more friends because you know they their social skills are impaired and friends help that quality of life. So we get first steps or action steps of people, not only the teacher, not only the parent, but other people in other agencies and siblings and community people who are familiar with the student all come together to address this plan. And then you revisit this plan. And sometimes um, this current set of plan negates the need for a functional behavioral assessment. So Don's gonna talk about tier three systems. He may talk about these five um, things, I don't know, but I have it here that this is in our tier three blueprint that you have, uh, that you can read more about. These are our publications, PTR, so you know, I'm whisking through them. And now I'm ready for questions, eight minutes. Okay, you've got a few minutes for questions. A couple of them are pretty simple. Um, we'll see if they are, hold on. Uh, does the iBurst take the place of ABC recording? ABC recording is really more your functional behavior assessment because you're gonna say what are the antecedents and what are the consequences. The iBurst is actually what your, how the student's behavior is as, on that day. And it allows you to get a baseline of how many times does the behavior occur or at what um, perceptual level does this behavior occur? So I would say the ABC would, your, would be your functional behavior assessment. Um, it doesn't mean you don't, you can't use the ABC, but counting up all of those little cards and doing all that can sometimes be more time consuming to use it as your progress monitoring data. When you do the eye burst across the entire process, you're able to uh, review baseline and intervention and be able to see whether or not your interventions are actually working in a snapshot. Okay, another question is, uh, how do you, I deal with uh, behaviors that may be, may be multiple, have multiple functions or that um, a situation where the student 
has to engage in escape behavior to get out of the curriculum in order to get access to something else. Where's uh, the function? We have uh, my other student I often use to show the uh, case study is a student with autism who had exactly has multiple functions. So he is a screamer um, and he tended to scream during multiple events. One big event though was transitions from something he likes to something he didn't like. Um, so the team, uh, what we try to do is try to get the team to identify what is the primary function by asking them a whole lot of behaviors and observing, of course. Um, the team first thought it was attention primarily because it got a lot of attention with his screaming um, and the attention intervention that they developed to replace the behavior did not work. And so we went, we, we then decided it was an escape to attention um, function but you're describing escape to a tangible function. Uh, so they scream to escape because they're able to get a more preferred, hopefully activity. What we tend to do is say, let's address the primary function first. So if you think it's primarily escape, let's make sure we give the student a brief way to escape. However, one of the additional supplemental reinforcers you can do to reinforce appropriate behavior, like if we, he actually engages, for example, and transitions, then maybe he gets the skittle he really was trying to get with his escape behavior because he wanted skittles, or we're able to get him more um, preferred activities based upon he transitioned. Now at the end of this transition, after five minutes, you now get to do a preferred activity because you came to this non-preferred activity. So that's how um, we tend to guide those interventions that have okay. multiple functions. Good. Uh, one qu question that came up was on the prevent, teach, reinforce table of interventions. There are little ampersands there. What do those mean? And do you have to choose only one or what is the, what are you trying to communicate with the little uh, ampersands or stars? Those ampersand means they must, those, that particular intervention must be on the strategy. So in the um, slide, the replacement behavior is the one that's asterisk on that um, menu we have to teach a replacement behavior. There's no way for the team or the teacher to escape that. Um, so it's it's divided, subdivided into functional and um, more desired. What we're trying to do is like, for example, Jeff, many of us would wanna teach him to, uh, instead of being academic engaged, we'd say, let's just teach him to ask for a break, right? That's a functional replacement behavior. It's a way, a community functional replacement behavior. It's a way of getting him a direct way of getting a brief escape. But we do have a lot of teachers that aren't going to be really gung ho about that. And we don't want to make this about us behavior analysts. Let me tell you what's going to work or what's not going to work because that never wins them over. Uh, so we allowed to also have them select instead of or in addition to a functional replacement behavior, they could just go with we want to teach him how to be academically engaged or like Deontay, we want to teach him to be able to engage in respectful language. Um, but they have to have a replacement behavior and reinforce. There's only two interventions there. They have to have a reinforcement intervention that reinforces the replacement behavior. And they have to have an intervention that will describe what the teacher is supposed to do if Deontay does disrespectful behavior and statements or if Jeff decides to be disruptive. Okay. I think we have two other quick questions. Uh, one is, is there a form of training or modules for learning and implementing PTR? How do people learn it learn to do it? I would love to have some modules. One of these days I'm going to make modules and one of my other PTR grants gets funded. That's what we will do. So we currently don't have modules. However, we have a lot of tools and a lot of uh, professional development models that can be used. You have access to all the information. We have the books. Um, however, if you really wanna learn a little bit more about how to do this, um, please email me because I can probably hook you up to some webinars where there's a lot more time that actually goes over um, how to do this in more detail. So please, I, my email is at the very first. Um, if you don't want to spend money on the book, for example, and I don't blame you, I wouldn't spend money on the book either. Uh, go to the, just email me and I can send you more materials. Okay. And I have a question here of, uh, Folks would want to know, you talked about a coaching manual. Is that loaded up or can you load that it's into the- not loaded up. If a lot of people are interested in that, I would be happy 
to um, at the end of the day because I have to be Dawn's um, Vanna and he's doing a very good job actually doesn't have a nice radio voice actually like a DJ uh, I, or like soft music station uh, yes I will load up the coaching manual okay I think that was Rose's way of saying that I have a face made for radio uh, <laughs> So uh, one last thing, in Florida's districts, we have just a minute left, uh, after teams are trained, who does the follow-up coaching? Ah, uh, wonderful. So we always ask, when we do professional development, um, there's a lot of different models. We do ask who are going to be the coaches. And we try to, ask, we do have a training, um, professional development model on how to train coaches, people to be coaches for PTR. Um, typically the coach is somebody who doesn't have a classroom position uh, because they have to have some flexibility to be able to um, be with teachers. And so it tends to be people like school psychologists, behavior specialists, behavior analysts, sometimes social workers, sometimes guidance counselors. Um, and so we're able to provide that support to them on how to be coaches. This is some as a two-part training where there's training on just how to implement PTR and then also a training on how do you, or how are you a coach? Um, so when we talk with people again, they select who are going to be the candidates in their district or at their school, um, if, they're, if they're approaching the principals, who would be the best people who could be a coach. Um, and has to have those characteristics. It also has to be somebody that other people like, because uh, there's some people who have a lot of knowledge, but we get teachers say, I don't listen to what they say because I truly, I just don't like them because it's their way or the highway. We get that an awful lot. So uh, you want it to be somebody who can be collaborative and have good communication skills. Well, I think we've met, reached our time limit because everything shut down on my end. So I think we're done. Uh, <laughs> Take care and thank you very much, Dr. Ivanone, and uh, you know, stay tuned for the final presentation in our series. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you all. I'm going to end the session.